This conference will now be recorded. All right, folks, good evening. Excited to be here tonight and discuss with you about this chapter regarding special senses. So we are going to start off with the special sense of smell. Uh, we use the term proper term olfaction. And we know as far as uh, studying in AMP1 class that the sense of olfaction, or sense of smell, does not pass through uh, the thalamus, right? The thalamus is the sensory relay center, and the sense of smell does not do that. It goes right to area of the cortex where we would have for olfaction, okay? And passing through those, um, the sensory neurons that will be, these sensory neurons, these olfactory neurons, will be replaced on a regular basis as far as every few months. These are very uh, unique neurons that are being re replaced, right? We know that really neurons present within the central nervous system uh, do not, as a, as a whole, as a general uh, rule of thumb, do not renew. They do not uh, get replaced. Once the neurons die, they die. Uh, they get replaced with scar tissue and that's it. There's no renewal of the neurons except for in the case of uh, the sensory neurons. Okay? The olfactory bulbs will then receive this information via the neurons that pass through uh, the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone. Remember, when we looked at the uh, inner portion, the anterior cavity of the, uh, where we removed the calvarium, the skull cap, and we can see in the uh, inside of the skull, and we're looking at the anterior, middle, and posterior uh, regions of the skull. We can see that in the anterior region there, we have uh, removed the frontal bone, and then what are we seeing? But uh, very deep within the cristagalli and the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone. Okay, so here we are. We're looking at an image here, and we're seeing here are the holes in the cribriform plate, and we're seeing that these actually neurons will pass through. And what's going on is that these olfactory receptor cells are, and there are cilia present here, they're covered in a very thick mucus that will be a protective mucus barrier. And, and know that when we need to, when we can, how we can have our sense of smell and smell odorants that enter into the nasal passage, uh, they have to be within some type of liquid medium in order for uh, the receptor cells of the cranial nerve number one to receive that information and then send that information to uh, the, the cranial nerve number one, the olfactory nerve. I know that we are going to, we'll be going over more of the specific anatomy present within uh, the whole nasal cavity here. Of note, this right here, this is the area where the eustachian tube in the nasopharynx, superior aspect of the throat, the nasopharynx, this is where we end up having uh, the uh, eustachian tube opening up to the environment here and being able to equalize the pressure in the middle ear. And we'll review that tonight. So as with many uh, special senses, they are bipolar neurons, okay? one dendrite, one axon. When we think of multipolar neurons, we think of multiple dendrites and one axon. Okay? We see these ciliary cilia present for uh, this special sense in order to allow for participation in the action potential information. Um, recall G protein activation is where we can, when, when substances cannot directly enter into a cell, they'll interact with um, receptors on the plasma membrane of a cell and then cause a change to take place deep within the cell. Okay, so know that this, the, oh, no, sorry, uh, mix that, sorry, thinking of something different, different than the, the actual, I apologize, sorry about that. It's a little bit of a different situation in comparison to what I was just thinking about. I apologize, made a mistake, no big deal. Um, focus on this, folks, as far as the low threshold and rapid accommodation. That is very important because as you smell whatever kind of odorants are in the air, understand that um, you can smell, you, you have a, we humans have a pretty good sense of smell, uh, nowhere near in comparison to a dog. Um, in comparison to a dog, we would have our sense of smell and the sensory receptors would be about the size of a quarter or so as far as the, um, a dog, now depending upon the size of the dog, but in comparison, as far as ratio wise, about the size of like a, a dessert plate, okay? So we're looking at quite a difference in 
the ability for us to have a sense of smell and for in particular dogs to have a sense of smell which is on another level and this is why they sniff each other and they do what they do because that's how they're receiving a lot of information um, and know that that rapid accommodation when we smell something good or bad we usually can accommodate to it pretty quickly so that the smell the discomfort the whatever that odor is whether it's disturbing or not or pleasant we still accommodate to it pretty quickly Cribiform plate, I mentioned to you before, um, also the olfactory tract. So the extension of the olfactory bulb is the olfactory tract of this uh, of this apparatus here for uh, cranial nerve number one. Um, you know that it goes to the sensory cortex. And so the sensory cortex would be the um, post-central gyrus of the parietal lobe. Now you'll see here that lateral, medial, and intermediate regions, these are all the areas of the olfactory cortex that are working together, right, in order for you to be able to have um, your conscious perception of smell, um, giving an emotional context to smell, which would be the medial and intermediate, kind of working together with the lateral, medial regions to really help us to have an understanding for not only just sensing a sense of smell, but where, what does that represent? something good something bad um, what is it associated with if I smell a skunking a skunky type smell well it can either be an actual skunk outside or it can be marijuana that someone's smoking so you know depending upon uh, these different uh, odors we have a context as to what's correlated with the odor your sense of taste this would be your gustatory sensation or gustation right okay? um, here we have and you're showing you here regions of the tongue right now this is more of an older and this is information that they don't really put a whole lot of weight in as they used to years ago regarding different scent areas of the tongue having different sensations and such sweet sour salty bitter and such eh. now it's just pretty much a matter of that throughout the whole tongue yes there are these sensations that can be experienced and uh they don't just put specific areas to them like they did years ago but this is showing you that we have different areas of the tongue that have different taste buds. And these taste buds are what are going to be, um, and I'm gonna, we're going to see names for them in just a moment, um, that will actually, uh, not, they have the sensory receptors for your sense of taste. But know that there's a lot of um, what are called uh, villi, okay? These, let me show you here. Filiform papillae. Papillae. The filiform papillae cover the majority of the tongue, okay? And they act to uh, act as like a keeping the tongue rough and having um, not a smooth surface, okay? It has a little bit of a roughened surface. I think of it analogous to like a terry cloth, like a washcloth has all those little little parts to it that make the terry cloth not smooth, but it's a little rough in there so it can hold on to the soap as you clean yourself. Well, on the case of the tongue, it allows for it to be a roughened type surface so that you can hold on to the food so that you can chew it as well as possible and then swallow. Now know that you'll see here that we have, there are certain taste buds present here. Now the filiform, these are not taste buds. They just give um, a sense of um, these filaments and a sense of roughness to the tongue, but they're not taste buds. But all the other three, these do have taste buds. So there are taste buds with the filiform. There are these valate and these foliate. And these are fungiform here, the bigger ones. You see the dots right here? Those are fungiform. So we have these three other areas of papillae, types of papillae, that do have taste buds present. So the filiform cover most of the tongue, most common, but they do not have taste buds. But valate, fungiform, and foliate have taste buds. So fungiform, you see the larger dots, valate, aka circumvallate, and foliate, they all have taste buds associated with them in order to then uh, send information to the brain as far as helping you to understand your perception of taste. Right, so you'll just see that these have, you should know where these are located and how filiform does not have taste buds, but the other three do.
but they're all considered papillae. Now, I mentioned to you these, these uh, case, I didn't mention umami, aka uh, this glutamate here. So when you're thinking of salty, sweet, sour, we get that, right? Uh, the bitter, we understand that also, okay? Um, know that bitter has the lowest threshold and really bitter in nature when we taste bitter objects where we're tasting substances uh, that could quite possibly be poisonous. And so it makes sense that the body would be able to recognize at a very low, very low level um, bitter tastes because that could mean life or death for the, for the human. Now uh, know that umami, right? Umami is this um, brothy type of sensation and taste that we have. Um, think uh, soy sauce, right? Uh, think a juicy steak, um, a juicy tomato. These are all this sensation or roll of the amino acids for, um, it's craved by the human, this brothy type of a, of a taste. It's newer in comparison to sweet, sour, salty, bitter, as far as discovery was. So tastin, as well as odorant, right, you would smell, um, they have to be attached to some type of liquid, dissolved in some type of liquid. So the same also with tastins. These substances would be dissolved in saliva. There's saliva and mucus present uh, within the oral cavity. As far as the nasal cavity, mucus is present, okay? So there needs to be some type of liquid that these tastins, odorants, are dissolved in in order for the, the body to recognize um, and stimulate the, uh, the sensory receptors. Okay? Now, also of, of point in not seeing here as far as temperature, texture, and, and also the sense of smell can all have factors present within your sense of taste. Um, we've all had some type of sinus infection or congestion, and this absolutely affects your ability to taste. Um, know that temperature, whether it's something is cold or hot, really can make a difference in how much of a flavor sensation you're experiencing, as well as the texture, folks. Um, so things like um, have weird te texture. So like oysters, have a weird kind of a texture to them. Uh, it's something that I don't really appreciate too much. So I think that it's the texture. H how about also um, snails? That's kind of a really kind of a weird kind of a, you know, texture to it. And I just, I don't know, for me, that just, I can't get past it. So they all are factors involved in mushrooms. Okay, that's another one that's kind of a little weird, to be honest, the texture. I agree with you there, yeah. And so that can affect what goes on regarding our sense of taste, gustation. Uh, too funny. <laughs> and that's okay, you know, right, really. I mean, that's the beauty of, uh, of <laughs> how we can have all these different types of foods out there for us to taste. And I tell you that there are things that I like now that I didn't like when I was a child. And there are things that I like when I was a child that right now I'm just kind of like, eh, couldn't care less. So it's too funny regarding how your palate will change over a period of time. Yeah. I mentioned to you already about the bitter there. Now, uh, cranial nerve number, <laughs> Kyle, that's too funny, Kyle. <laughs> that's a good thing, truly. You know, that's a good thing. We should, I, I tip it, to be honest, I have to say that I'm grateful for all the food that we do have opportunity to access and eat. And uh, we, are, we are very fortunate in the United States in comparison to many areas of the world, truly. Um, I have cousins that are, um, that live in other areas of the world. And I would tell you that, um, <laughs> nice, Jen, trying everything, that's a good thing. That uh, really, you know, what, what we have in comparison to other areas of the world, we are very fortunate indeed. So I'm grateful for the opportunity to have the food we have. Cranial nerve number seven, nine, and 10. Um, thank you, Norma, I agree. Cranial nerves number seven, nine, and 10, you know, these are involved in your sense of taste, okay? So the anterior two thirds of the tongue, seven. Posterior third of the tongue, nine. Vagus nerve, this is wild, the epiglottis. The epiglottis, which blocks the, the food and the liquid from entering into uh, the trachea, the, uh, the respiratory, excuse me, the respiratory system. Yeah, that's, that's sending some type of sensation of taste in the epiglottis. So that's pretty funny, it's pretty interesting. Again, too, you'll see here the pathway from the medulla oblongata to the thalamus, to the cerebral cortex, the taste region. Your sense of vision, okay? Your sense of vision, your sense of hearing, 
Uh, we'll be talking about that now over the next uh, while here as we're finishing up with this chapter. And you'll see here as far as the um, extrinsic eye muscles, we discussed that in lab. I showed you that in the video and um, I'll show you right here as far as here you can test by doing this H pattern here regarding um, your sense of the ability for your eye muscles, the extrinsic eye muscles, to move the eye in certain patterns. And so that's for clinically, you could do that. And you can work that, do that and practice that on someone in your family, okay? As far as the anatomy is concerned, we went over this in lab and I went over it on the video, but let's go over it here now as far as the cornea, right? We have the anterior cavity, the posterior cavity. Anterior cavity contains two compartments, right? So there's an anterior and a posterior chamber, and then we have the posterior cavity, right? This contains aqueous humor, it's a liquid, it's continually flowing. When there's issues with this flowing, this can, this can cause glaucoma, increased pressure in the eye, and that's intraocular pressure, and that's not a good thing, it can lead to blindness. The posterior cavity contains this vitreous humor, aka okay, vitreous body, which is a gelatinous type substance, which will give the body to the, uh, the eyeball itself. The second layer is the choroid. So the sclera is the white of the eye. The clear portion would be the cornea. That's the fibrous tunic. The choroid is the vascular tunic. It's the middle layer. And the retina is the neural tunic. It's the inner layer. Okay? And you'll see here the fovea is the bullseye of the macula lutea, this region over here. And You'll also, you'll note that um, this is the area of the highest concentration of cones. These are, uh, the, the cones are involved in um, your photoreceptors for your sense of color and sharp vision. The rods are present for peripheral vision and night vision, low light vision. And they surround the area of the retina of the macula and the fovea centralis. The optic disc, is this region right here where we have cranial nerve number two exiting the eyeball, okay? Because information is going from the photoreceptors to distal through cranial nerve number two uh, to eventually, you know, to the thalamus and then to the occipital lobe, right? Your visual cortex. You'll see here that we call this the blind spot of the eye. And I will uh, allow for, I, I know that I have, um, I have a little paper and a little description of how you can test the blind spot of your eye. I'll share that with you all, okay? I'll make sure that I do that. And here you're also seeing the some of the extraocular eye muscles. You're seeing here the iris, which creates the pupil, a hole. Here's the lens, suspensory ligaments, and the ciliary muscle. And you'll see here as far as I've gone through uh, these different layers and such. So you can look at all these this information here and review that. I want to show you here as far as the retina is concerned, there are two layers. So not only is the choroid layer, the vascular layer, the middle layer pigmented, but also um, there is a pigmented portion of the retina and then the sensory portion of the retina. This would be deeper, right? And this would be more superficial of the retina so that we have the photoreceptors, those rods and cones. And we'll look at, this is a great image here. What you're seeing here, folks, is that, so light would be refracted, bent to the retina. And then the action potentials, the actual um, information that's gonna be received, will be received by these rods and cones. And then you'll see here we have the secondary neuron and the ganglion cells. And the ganglion cells all come together, right? These axons here form, the optic nerve, and that will take information to thalamus and eventually to the uh, cortex, the occipital region of the brain. Rods, cones, come back in a moment here. So rods, uh, location of the rods are most of the retina, okay, but not the fovea, right? This is the, this is the deal. The fovea has the highest concentration of cones, for your sharp vision. So if you're focusing on something on your screen right now, it's the light coming off of whatever your computer and refracting bent to the fovea so that you're seeing and you're focusing on that point. That's your sharp vision, okay? Um, 
black and white vision, your low light vision, the rods. Cones, again, your sharp vision, your color vision. Um, again, highest number in the fovea centralis, as well as the macula, the outer portion. But the fovea centralis, that's the bullseye of the macula. Visual acuity, that's sharp vision. You'll see here only three three types, right? Blue, red, and green. Yet the combinations that can be that can come about as a result of blue, red, and green give you all of the spectrum of color that we see in the world. And that's quite remarkable, to be honest. All right. So uh, yeah, the fovea and the macula make up the area of light focus in the retina. Really, that's where we're that's where the bending of light is trying to go to that area. Now. Can there be issues where we have either uh, issues with um, near vision, so myopia, right? So we can see, so we can see uh, nearsightedness, or farsightedness as far as um, in terms of hyperopia, right? So either we're farsighted, we're nearsighted. If we have, if we have some type of corrective lenses, we can also have issues where there's a issue with stigmatism, where the cornea or the lens also is kind of misshapen a bit mentioned to you about the optic disc. Now the optic disc is the blind spot of the eye because there are no photoreceptors present there. I mentioned to you regarding the anterior cavity, the posterior cavity. The anterior cavity contains anterior and posterior chambers, okay, so don't get that confused, and know that this is where aqueous humor is present, vitreous humor, aka vitreous body, in the posterior compartment. And all of this, right, anterior compartment is from the cornea to the lens. Posterior to the lens would be the posterior compartment, aka the posterior cavity. The lens held by the suspensory ligaments. In the lab, they're white lines coming off of the uh, ciliary muscle in red. And it can change shape in order to bend the light wherever it's coming from, folks, and whether it's near or far. Um, that's how we're bending the light so that we can see it. Uh, and again, fo focusing that light on uh, the fovea. So the term metropia, right? So we're talking about this is normal resting condition of the eyes, of the lens, okay? And so this would represent as far as for near point vision, um, closer than 20 feet as we're focusing, far point, 20 feet or more. Um, know that this is an, uh, the type of vision where it's healthy, normal vision, okay? Now, we can have issues as far as called presbyopia. This is changes within the lens as a result of us getting older, okay? And really much, very similar to um, issues like hyperopia, um, farsightedness, similar to, but different as far as the actual uh, mechanism. So in the case of presbyopia, it's the lens that's an issue. In the case of hyperopia, it's a matter of how big the eyeball is. We'll look at that in just a moment. I'll show you an image that'll help make some more sense. So refracting light is very important. Okay? It's this bending of light so that we can have it go and focus to the area of the retina that will enable us to be able to focus and see clearly. Okay? The focal point, this is the this term is very important also because it's the point upon which you are focusing. So let's look at, and we'll come back to this slide in just one moment here. Let's see. Oh, you know, I didn't, I thought I had to put it in here. All right, so I'm going to help you right now. I'm gonna, I'm gonna add a slide here and I will share this with you all so that you can see this here, or I'll just share the image. How's that? Let me just share the image of. Maybe I did share these images with you. I'm not sure, but they're not in the PowerPoint. But just take a look at this, and then I'm going to show you corrective lenses. Here we go.
Okay, so um, yeah, all right. So as we look at this image here, let's let's see. So looking at this image here, so myopia, uh, you'll see that the eyeball here is too long, right? See where the focus is? It's anterior to the fovea, right? The eyeball is too long. In the case of hyperopia, right? Farsightedness, so nearsightedness, farsightedness, the eyeball is too short because look where the focus is taking place. But when we have this uh, concave and convex lenses, they can help us to focus whatever we're looking at right in the area of the fovea where it needs to be. So the lens can make the correction for us depending upon what type of issue we have going on, right? So whether it's myopic, whether we're nearsighted or farsighted, hyperopia. I'll share this image with you all. Okay, so let's see here. Yeah, so structures refracting light. This is important that you know that, that the cornea, the clear portion of the uh, sclera, the outer fibrous covering, the fibrous tunic of the eye, the aqueous humor, the vitreous humor, and the lens all are involved with, and the lens has the primary focus of refracting or bending light uh, to the macula, okay, to the fovea, the bullseye of the macula. So here are these terms, nearsightedness, farsightedness, myopia, hyperopia, presbyopia, we looked at as far as the lens is the issue. Diplopia, this would be double vision. This can be as a result of issues with the external um, extrinsic eyes muscles, those muscles that are that are skeletal muscle that can move the eye, right? If there's issues, we can have the eye kind of one eye going in another direction there, okay? Um, astigmatism, okay? Uh, this, and let's take a look here also. This can, so, so strabismus can cause diplopia show you here. Here we go. And here we're going to look at a little child because understand that when these issues are going on, right, the strabismus, this eye, this left eye is being afflict, affected, um, this can then affect what's taking place as far as how the child is seeing, the visual input that's taking place. And if this is not corrected, folks, this can lead to um, issues where the brain will not accept input from this eye and will only take input from this eye if it's not corrected in young. Yeah, that's right, that's correct. That's another term that they'll call that, yes, indeed. And some have it worse than others. Some it's just pretty mild and some it's pretty severe. So here, you know, that, that again too, that's another one that's pretty severe actually, okay? So, and um, glaucoma, I mentioned to you re regarding the intraocular pressure, and that has to do with um, usually blockage of flow of the uh, aqueous humor, right? In the anterior compartment. I'm not sure it's going weird. Whenever my glasses are off. Yeah, so, yeah, so the glasses do contribute to a corrective effect for what's taking place with you there. Understood. Thank you for sharing. So here are some other uh, terms that we would like to look at as far as disorders are concerned, and that can affect your vision. So macular degeneration. I, I like to point these two out. Macular first and retinitis pigmentosa. So one, we're looking at the rods in particular being the effect, okay? And one, we're looking at the fovea and the macular region being affected. So let's take a look here. So here, this is as a result of a cataract affecting the field of vision, okay? So cataracts, there's a clouding of the lens, okay? Retinal detachment, this is a, a, an emergency. And if you start seeing flashes like lightning strikes in your field of vision, you need to go to the emergency room, okay? There's something going on with your retina and they need to address that pretty quickly, okay? Uh, diabetic uh, issues uh, regarding uh, circulation uh, can affect and bleeds that can take place within the, the retina and within the eye. Um, this can be an issue, okay? And can lead to blindness, actually. 
Uh, but macular degeneration, retinitis pigmentosa. So here we have macular degeneration. And this example here shows you that to the left, normal view, to the right, you're seeing that the central view where your sharp vision should be located, right? That's where the fovea, the macula, the, that region right there, that's being damaged. And so it's affecting that. You have peripheral vision, but central vision is being lost. Here's the opposite of this. So you have no peripheral vision, but you have this tunnel vision because we've affected the rods in particular. Okay. And so you're only looking looking through the eye like through this little little tube here. Um, both are not, you know, really good, folks. They're, you would not want to experience either of them, truly. Um, be really difficult. I mean, look at and and when I look at the beauty that of the world that we live in. Yes, there's a lot of there's a lot of rough things. I get it, right? But there's a lot of beauty in the world, and really, I I feel so fortunate that I live where I live in an area where there's I'm farmland is five minutes away. I'm driving through farmland when I come to work. When I do come on campus, um, it's a really a very scenic route. I see a lot of pretty scenery and farmland and animal. It's just really really pretty, you know. Um, Take the time to observe what's around you and, and enjoy the beauty that you can see. Um, we, we have a relative who, through marriage, through my son-in-law coming into the, our lives, that uh, his father is blind. And I'll tell you, working with someone who's blind, you get a new perspective on um, the beauty that we have, the, the, how fortunate we are to be able to see. Yeah, it's, it's remarkable. Your sense of hearing. Now, let me just stop for a moment. How are we doing? Okay, I know I'm going through it pretty quick, but I'm trying to cover a lot of information in a short period of time. And then you have these videos to return back to and review and take notes from and pause when you watch the video and re-listen re to it and then call and you know take notes, folks. It's so very important. And uh, like I said, I'm glad. I'm glad. I really am because I feel that it is a way that um, I'm the one giving you the test. So being able to review my material that I'm sharing with you all, I think it can be very helpful. So I'm glad for you. That's good. Yep, I want to do all that I can to help you really do well. So I'm going to hide everyone again, continue sharing our, you're, you're welcome, Norma, absolutely. Yeah, no problem. Let's just look here. So we have, yep. yeah, so some more slides to go through and then uh, we'll be done for this evening. So in our sense of hearing, right, sense of hearing, um, the apparatus really is located in the inner part of our ear, okay? So there's an outer, middle, and inner ear. And those that were on campus uh, saw this with the models, and those that watched the videos saw this on the videos of the models, showing us that we have the oracle, aka the pinna, this is the external ear, comprised of um, elastic cartilage, right? The external auditory meatus, the external external auditory canal, external acoustic meatus. There are multiple terms that can be used for this canal that just has ceruminous glands. It has oil, uh, not oil, earwax producing glands that will help to keep it supple and smooth, soft within, right? Um, as well as hairs that are present. Um, and then uh, the tympanic membrane, you, aka your eardrum. So you have here again, external, middle, internal, inner ear, okay? And we have cranial nerve number eight, the vestibulocochlear nerve. So vestibular region, cochlear region. You have here, so we've got the tympanic membrane, we have the malleus, incus, and the stapes, right? The hammer, the anvil, the stirrup, those are just old fashioned terms, but they, they, they help you to think of the fact that, hey, yeah, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes, meso covering, stapes covering the oval window. You can see it right there. Here's the round window. And so when when we have, sorry, folks. My daughter. <laughs> my kids are funny. We like to laugh a lot and uh, we have fun sending each other funny videos. And so I just, she just sent me a video of a cat. <laughs> some crazy stuff and we're animal lovers so you know we love all kinds of animals and just seeing just the 
cute things that animals can do and such. It's a lot of fun. Makes you laugh. You need to laugh, folks. You need to enjoy life a little bit there. You need to enjoy life a lot, actually, not just a little bit. <laughs> but at times when you're under stress, it can be difficult. I understand that. So in this middle ear, folks, this is a uh, this should not be, we, we should not have a whole lot of liquid buildup in here, right? That's bad. So if you have otitis media, middle ear infection, then there will be an infection and there will be liquid present within here that could actually, as it builds up, pushing up against the tympanic membrane, causing it to actually burst, right? Causing there to be a ruptured uh, uh, eardrum, ruptured tympanic membrane. It's very painful and uncomfortable. And what takes place is that the eustachian tube is supposed to equalize the pressure here. Well, the eustachian tube opens up in the superior aspect, it's called the nasopharynx, the superior aspect of your throat. And so an infection in your throat, hold on here, an infection in your throat can travel through the eustachian tube. It's not always open, right? It pops. When you hear that popping noise in your ear, that's the eustachian tube opening, trying to equalize the pressure within the middle ear. And so infection can travel from the, the throat right, the pharynx to the middle ear, and that causes an infection. For children, the eustachian tube, comparison, So here we have an image that's going to show you between and let's see larger one there. There we go. So you see the angle for an adult, and you see the angle for an infant, a child, right? Less than seven years. And so you see how it's it's a steeper angle for an adult, not so much for a child. And so what can happen is that opening up into the nasopharynx, so an infection can travel, enter into the middle ear and cause a middle ear infection. Now know that. A external otitis externa is swimmer's ear. So we have ceruminous glands that produce cerumen, earwax. And so water can end up in the external acoustic meatus or auditory meatus or auditory canal, can get stuck in here and can cause infection. There can be bacteria that can be built up and, and, and grow and, and cause an infection. So that's swimmer's ear, swimmer's ear, otitis externa middle ear infection, otitis, otitis media, okay? Now, sure, yeah, so let's look at that again. So let me just show you, my son gets that and it's tough because, he, yeah, so here's the deal. Let's see here, so let's minimize this. He does scuba diving, oh wow, okay. Yeah, so you'll see here, folks, that, oops, no, you won't see here. <laughs> Sorry, here we go. So you'll see here, as far as the younger the child, the the less the uh, the angle of the eustachian tube, the auditory tube. This is the tube that helps to equalize the pressure in the middle ear. But even for adults, it still can travel through the eustachian tube into the middle ear and cause infections and such. Okay, so this opens up. Let's show you where it opens up. I'll just show that to you again. So. So on our sagittal head model, so look at this model right here. So this is the nasal cavity, right? Here's where the cribriform plate is of the ethmoid bone. And so here we have our uh, sensation for olfaction for sense of smell. Here, this area right here, so this is the nasopharynx, oropharynx, laryngeopharynx, you'll have to know that, not now but soon. And right here, this is an opening for the eustachian tube, aka the auditory tube. So that's where the tube opens up. So when you equalize the pressure for the middle ear, this is where it opens up right there, folks. Okay? Here you have, by the way, your pharyngeal tonsil, aka your adenoids, 
Here's your palatine tonsil, your lingual tonsil. This is the oral cavity. Here's the tongue. Right? Hard palate, soft palate, uvula. Right? Here's your um, vocal cords, your vocal folds. Doke. So let's move on here. So this is cool. And what I'm showing you right here is that this image, you can see that the cochlea is curled up, right? Looks like a, a shell, does it not? And you'll see here that this is the oval window, right? Miso, Meliosynchus, Stapes, oval window, Miso. Here's the round window. The round window is like the pressure relief valve for pressure that's being pushed upon here by the oval window so that it's pushing against fluids that will stimulate sensory receptors for your sense of hearing in the cochlear duct for your sense of hearing. And then what's going to happen is that then there's going to be this the pressure of pushing up against these fluids needs to be alleviated and that'll be alleviated right here by the round window. Here is the vestibular portion for and the semicircular canals. For your sense of balance and equilibrium. So vestibular portion of cranial nerve number eight, the cochlear portion of cranial nerve number eight. I want to show you this here because what you're seeing is that so there is fluid here and there's fluid here with the cochlear duct. Right? And so here's where you have your sensory receptors for your sense of hearing. And know that on the cochlea, the high frequency, high pitch sounds are registered here. Low pitch right here, distal. So when we again go back to this image right here, you can see right here could be low pitch, high pitch, okay? And as we go further, low pitch is being registered, being received by the sensory receptors, okay? So as the sound waves are funneled in via the oracle, aka the pinna, into this canal will hit the tympanic membrane and cause movement to take place here. And it's just, honestly, even your sense of hearing, what you would miss by not being able to hear the sounds that, that we are able to appreciate. Now, some of the sounds um, like screaming and yelling and uh, bad things, I don't miss so much, right? If you're, but truly, I mean, overall, listening to beautiful music, listening to a significant other talk to you, right? This is sad if you don't have that ability to be able to communicate in that manner. Um, so pretty cool stuff. So you're seeing here also, what I wanted to show you was that we're taking a cross section of the cochlea. So here we looked at stretched out and seeing as far as frequencies and how you're able to uh, register them and receive them by the sensory receptors of uh, the cochlear duct present within this region right here. So this region right here, is the inner region of the um, cochlea. And you'll see that we have above and below. So let's look it back here. So above and below, so this fluid, so here's the oval window, here's the stapes. So we're pushing the fluid and we're pushing it and then it goes around and then pressure relief valve here, the round window. Understood? So there's, oh, I don't know. but it made a noise okay hopefully my mouse is okay why is it that our oh, i'm gonna have to okay why is it that our voice sounds different to ourselves when we hear our own voice in a recording it's not the same yeah and and i'll tell you why it's because of how in the sense of hearing you have a bone conduction and you have air conduction for your sense of hearing so bone conduction actually does go through the bones and air conduction, you know, we're having it coming through the canal there. Uh, so both aspects, when we when we speak, we're kind of hearing it different because it's kind of passing through also the bones of our skull, right? And as far as the vibrations are even received from our own, you know, skull and, and our um, sinuses, you know, your sinuses help to resonate the sound that you produce. When you're stuffy, right? Hi, how you doing? Yeah, you know, like understood, right? So like when you have a cold, when you have some type of sinus infection, it can affect how you sound. But yeah, perception for yourself, it's a little bit different than 
what other people hear. Yeah, so it's always weird when I hear if I'll like just, I, I don't listen to my videos, but if I put it on for a moment, just to see, make sure that the sound is okay and that I'm just like, oh, I don't like listening to myself talk. <laughs> but it's just, I think that's most people, unless you have, you know, quite a beautiful singing voice and such. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it is it is cool. It's very interesting for sure. Yeah. There, here we go. Oh. Okay, good. All right. So I just wanted to show you with this image here, I added this image to just show you that um, we're seeing here, here's the apparatus, folks. Here's where we actually have those receptors that are going to pass along the cochlear nerve, cranial nerve number eight, and then going to the thalamus and then to the um, uh, temporal lobes of our brain. And here's just a, a little bit of a more of an enhanced image showing you uh, in particular as far as the vestibule and as far as the semicircular canals for your sense of balance and equilibrium and working in conjunction with your um, cerebellum. So we have here and we've talked about this already so that's good. Inner ear we're looking at here so um, the vestibule and the semicircular canals dealing with uh, the different areas as far as that give our brain input regarding our movement, our sense of position of the head. And when we receive conflicting information from our sense of vision and our sense of hearing, really the, the really the, not the hearing, but the, the vestibule and the semicircular canals as far as your balance and equilibrium, conflicting data can lead to motion sickness. And that's never a fun thing. And having been in the Coast Guard and Early on, it was hard for me. I was having issues with motion sickness and such. Um, as an adult now, and for many years, I've been able to go on boats and just enjoy the water tremendously and really not get, <laughs> oh man, I'm sorry for you because motion sickness stinks. Now, I would tell you this, that there's still times like if I'm not driving, I need to just like close my eyes and sleep. Um, oh, wow, that's a shame. Uh, yeah, but, but being out on a boat, um, I, I've been out on sailboats and like a pretty fast clip and uh, and seas that are kind of, you know, up and down and, and I'm just enjoying it and just being out there is just awesome for me. But years ago when I was younger, it was definitely a problem. And when you're in the service and you're supposed to be out in the boats, that's a problem. So Dr. Prone became a cook. <laughs> but that's all right, because it helps me now with feeding my family and feeding my friends and just uh, it's a good thing. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah. When life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. <laughs> so this fluid here, as far as these fluids, these endolymph, the paralymph, these are the fluids that are present within the inner ear and the canals present within the inner ear. The hair cells, these are involved in your ability to have the sensation for um, balance and equilibrium as well as for your sense of hearing. And so look at this here as far as the static and the kinetic. So the kinetic labyrinth, so you're seeing here as far as that, when you move your head in different positions, right? Because these are in the different planes you can affect. So flexion and extension, rotation and lateral bending, lateral flexion. These will all affect what takes place as far as fluid moving in all of these planes and will give your, your brain the understanding of what position your head is placed within. Um, and then again, the vestibular region right here. Here you go. Is the static labyrinth. Okay. So evaluates the position of the head relative to gravity, detects linear, linear acceleration, deceleration. So as if you're in a car and you're kind of moving and then you stop and then things, that's what's going on as far as that ability to move and stop moving, what's going on with your head in rela relation to the rest of your body. These are pretty self-explanatory and I mentioned to you regarding pitch. So when, as far as the sense of um, volume or loudness, more receptors are stimulated as a result of an increase in volume. A decrease in volume, there are less uh, receptors stimulated. And the pitch, depending upon where in the cochlea, whether it's more proximal or distal, 
part of the cochlea will be whether we have higher low pitch frequencies which are affected. And know that because high pitch are located uh, more proximal, um, we, we start to lose high pitch uh, earlier on as we get older than low pitch sensation. And isn't this the case as far as with uh, aging that it really truly does slow down all the processes of the body and so there, you're not going to have as great a taste as you did years ago, the sense of vision as you did years ago, the sense of hearing. I mean all of the sensations will will diminish a bit. Just you know the bottom line is take advantage of whatever it is that you do experience and have and and keep moving folks. I mean I got I, I have to continually remind myself because I'm right now in particular, when I was teaching, I like to be up and around and moving. I move around a lot, I'm standing, I'm walking, and I even like to walk around campus a lot. Um, when I'm here at home, oh, it's tough a little bit, not only just because I'm not here to be with you all and teach you all, you know, just digitally, but um, I'm sitting a lot and, and I hate that. So uh, we have to make sure that we take the time to move because our joints and our whole body needs, you know, cardiovascular system, all the systems of the body need movement in order to be well and healthy.